decided he wanted an interview with Alex Rose, and if he didn't get the interview, he was just going to just just try to ruin what we're trying to, you know, the work we're trying to do, and just make a hassle for us, you know, prove how tough he is with his power of the press or something, which I feel kind of like, you know, someone took a dump on me, because, I mean, we came to Chicago, because in L.A., it's just basically you got the world up your ass, and so we thought we'd get some work done, come here, and this guy's like telling, telling everybody where we're at, what we're doing, and why we're doing it, and this and that, you know, and then, then he's saying, but remember, it's not, it's not true, and uh, uh, but all through it, you know, basically, just kind of ruining the plans. It's it's hard enough to try to go and do some work, you know, when everybody wants to talk to you, you know, and you got work to do. Which is why you guys just took took off from L.A. in the first place. Yeah, you know, and you, you got some work to do and stuff, and you, and you can't, like, be hanging out with everybody and talking with every person that wants to talk because you're trying to get things done. And so now with this piece, it's like I can't go to where we're rehearsing and work, you know, because it's like then if I don't talk to people, then I'm definitely a jerk, you know, and it's it's not the case at all. It's just we're busy. You know, it's like, what do people want another record or not? You know. Yeah, I mean, it must with the popularity that you guys have now after um, such a short time, it just must be the most impossible thing to get any privacy whatsoever. And so what? This guy in the Tribune wanted to interview you guys, and you basically just said, "Hey, respect the fact that we want some privacy here in town, and and be cool." And then maybe we'll give you an interview when we're done working, so you don't. Yeah, exactly. Like here's a, here's a quote they got from our manager, and like we've turned down a lot of magazines, and we were really honored to be asked to do the magazines, but you know we were like worried about overexposure, and not, and we needed to get some time to ourselves and, and get things together because it's just gotten so big and it's weird to deal with because we were a street band, you know, and now we're not. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, you know, here's a quote. Um, we don't have to talk about any of this. Was the terse response from Doug Goldstein, co-manager of the group? "Quote: We turned down the cover of Expletive Newsweek. You know, not like knocking Newsweek, just saying you know. I mean, we just use I don't know our own language when we talk. You know, we've got the hottest band in America, and we don't need press to sell albums. We're not talking about where they are. Basically, the guy was being a jerk on the phone with Doug, and Doug went off on him. It's not. I don't want people to get the wrong idea that we just think we're too bad and da da da. It's like." We're just not out to kiss ass to get our work done, you know. It's like we're not going begging for press and this and that. And when we have time, you know, we'll do all the press that we can handle, you know. It's just... So it's, it's pretty funny that this guy from the Tribune couldn't get his way, and so he's going to use the little power that he, little power base he thinks he has there to get back at you guys. I mean, that's totally ridiculous. Yeah, just, just you know, because we wouldn't do an interview with him. We're jerks, you know, and, and just, just to screw us all up. And it's like... Thanks, man. What well, we came here was, you know, to try and... I mean, well, the only thing we did in L.A. is we were experts at hanging out. <laughs> well, we can't hang out no more. Yeah, well, Chicago's a good place to hang out unless your cover gets blown by a, a guy that is going to... I don't. I didn't see the article, but I guess he said everything in the article about what you guys are doing and where you're at specifically. We weren't really hiding the fact that we were Guns N' Roses, you know? We yeah. just... Well, you know, a lot of our listeners have called up, Axel, and let us know that they've spotted you around, but we've basically tried to keep the keep the thing low-key and tell people to be cool and leave you guys alone while you're in town. Yeah, I appreciate that a bit. I mean, it's like I'm from Lafayette, Indiana, you know, so I've listened to Chicago radio for a long time, and and we thought, well, New York can be too, can be too distractive, and in L.A. we definitely can't get any work done. We'll try another city, you know, and it's like the first thing I get is I get... Uh, what do, you, what do you call it? Um, like It's like a landmark type thing of Chicago, something representing the Chicago as the Tribune, and the first thing they do is start taking shots. Yeah, well, I, you know, I've dealt with this guy that wrote the article before, and I was kind of telling you this off the air. He wrote an article about the World Series of Rock that happened up at Alpine Valley. Just talking totally out his ass. He had no idea what he was talking about. It was obviously he wasn't at the concert. He was telling that Winger had two albums and that uh, the Bullet Boys album was titled one thing that it wasn't titled and basically just slamming hard rock heavy metal music uh saying that anybody with a brain wouldn't listen to it this kind of thing i get him on the air and, and he starts making excuses that it was the editor that uh took all the the correct stuff out of the article so obviously you know this guy is not representative of chicago and i, I really am sorry on behalf of uh the whole city of, of I appreciate that. you know of rockers here that love the stuff guns and roses is doing that uh, a guy like this can affect you guys that way well what this does is it kind of shows why okay not you know not all journalists not all press not anybody who's interviewing you not or aren't you know out to shoot you down or everything but you just get tired of taking the chance 
you know as a band you get tired of like trusting someone taking a chance and you just deal with the people that you're close with that you do like i basically have one person now that i do interviews with because he writes we put everything down you know we don't leave anything out we don't hide anything you know so it's not like just because he's my friend he's going to cover for me yeah right well you want somebody that can but that way i don't have to worry about you know someone who comes in acts like they take the band they like us and then when the piece comes out you know they've ripped each shreds i you know a lot of times i'll interview people and i'll use things that i've read out of magazines and they'll go what where did you read that you know so it's obvious that a lot of times it's, it's and the way i feel about it is like this besides how it fucking well sorry I'm sorry, I'm sorry. we'll edit that out <laughs> besides how it affects me besides how it affects me you know and gets my temper up it's not fair to your fans it's not fair to the fans who read it they get a picture of the band from some guy who obviously has a, an axe to grind you know they get a picture and they get stories told to them of stuff that's not true or whatever and you know definitely if they're talking with me at least in the band you know if the person's talking with me they're going to find out the facts you know i'm gonna tell them i don't you know i'm not trying to hide anything you know you know it's like what oh you know i'm supposed to be one of the world's biggest heroin addicts you know it's like that's the farthest from the fact just because i talk about you know what i've done it's like what's that guy who um didn't get to be a supreme court judge because he admitted he smoked pot right and, you know so now he's a pot smoker what he smoked pot what 20 years ago or something what was his name bork or something like that yeah i don't know yeah. it's like you know that everything just gets blown out of proportion so and especially when uh, you know as popular as guns and roses is these days everybody wants to write something about you so they need to fill a page and you know, it's obvious, like what this guy today in the Tribune did, is fill a page with a bunch of crap just because he couldn't get an interview with you. Mm -hmm. You know, I hate that. But you know, it's it's good that you know you're on the phone here with me tonight to kind of clear uh, clear things up for our listeners here tonight, Axel. Clear up a little bit here. I don't know if we'll be working here or not. Well, you know, if because it's like it's just only for the fact that here's the the real reason is this: I don't want to go to rehearsal, and then you've got. I don't know, however many people want to talk to you, take photos, sign this, sign that, blah, 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 while you're trying to, you know, keep your mind on your work. And if you don't do what they want, you're a jerk. So basic, the best thing to do is just try to avoid people altogether, you know. And it's Yeah, people always have their expectations, and, you know, your, your time must be just, the demands, I would imagine, must just be enormous on your time. With We don't really like having to avoid people, you know, because that, you know, makes you look like you think you're better. And... We don't enjoy that at all. We don't. We don't enjoy the appearance of having a bodyguard and going right through a, a place where there's a lot of people without talking to them, because you got things to do. It makes you look like you think you're too good, you know. Yeah, right. That's really an, that's one of the downsides of being famous, you know. Well, we I, didn't really plan. We, what we wanted was respect. We did not plan. We thought about you know trying to get a lot of respect. We didn't try to think about being famous, you know. And so we didn't really plan on or learn how to deal with being famous it's a pen yeah and it happened uh well I and mean, you guys were a street band in la like you said and it happened at the speed of light well yeah. was, and, and now now you've got to deal with all those things that must be quite uh quite a hassle at times yeah so like you know finally your 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 nerves have had it you know and out of nowhere someone comes up like slash slash went off on uh slash was getting his hair done and he didn't realize one of the people there was a worker and you know, and he's had all these people, you know, grabbing him and everything. And finally, when this one person came up, Slash finally just lost it and blew up. And it happened to be worth the workers. Uh -oh. And he was, you know, he felt really bad, you know. Mm -hmm. it, it's a strange thing. Well, you know, so you don't get an impression here in town. And, I, I mean, we're going to um, certainly not, you know, we don't want to leave you with that impression that this guy in the Tribune is, is representative of this town at all. And, you know, I, I think if you put out the word right now that people... I want to be with you Everywhere. Nice. And, you know, we're talking about it right now. Would you like to talk to some of the uh, true Guns N' Roses fans that I have on the yeah. phone? You want to? Sure. All right. Uh, the number, 831-1031. We've got Axel Rose with us here, who, uh, if you didn't see the article in the Tribune today, you may want to check it out. What section was that in? Tempo. Yeah, you might want to use it for, like, bottom of your birdcage or something like that, maybe? Exactly. Or to... A box. <laughs> okay, well, let me, let me see if I can uh, do this here. Cause let me see if I can connect the two phone lines. 
VBX. Hello. You're on with Axel. Oh, my God. Hi. What's happening? Nothing much. How's the new album coming? Well, we started working. Who knows? Depends on if we get work done. So when are you guys going to go on tour next? Uh, probably next spring. Oh, that'll be cool. The cleanup tour. <laughs> the cleanup tour? <laughs> why, do you, why do you call it that? Because everybody else's albums and tours are coming out this year. Oh, so you guys get to... So our goal is to have the cleanup tour. I get it. Any uh, any bands out there that you would choose at this point? I mean, you basically can pick... Uh, new bands that's like, uh, what, to, to open? Yeah. That's, that has a lot to do with how long our show is, because we don't want... One thing I don't like is that an opening band, you know, gets such a short set. And, you know, with union dues and things, there's certain reasons why you have to, you know, stop the show at a certain time, you know, and noise ordinances and things like that. And if we do have an opening band, I'd like them to really be seen for what they can do. So then there's the possibility that we may not take an opening band if we play a three-hour show. There's a, a band that I've been hearing that you guys are really into that's going to be coming through called Junkyard. Yeah, those guys, are, they're pretty cool. They're real, they're, they're real, you know, that's why I like them, because they're doing what they want to do from their heart, you know, and trying their best at it. You know, if someone doesn't like what they're doing now, I'm sure they'll get better. All right, well, that's fair enough. Uh, VBX, you're on with Axel Rose. Oh, my God. Axel, I love you, and I love the rest of the band. I think you guys are the best. You guys should yeah. ass. And are you going to leave uh, leave the guys in town, while, leave them alone while they're in town? Of course. <laughs> and respect their uh, need for privacy here in Chicago. Absolutely. Yeah. Did That's you, nice. Yeah. Did you see? Yeah. You got it. You got to get a little respect every now and then. Did you read the article in the Tribune? Not yet. I'm going to. Yeah. I think we already threw it away. I think everybody should just just write the Tribune about this David Silverman guy. You know, I'd say, well, if you're gonna you know talk about rock bands, get someone in there who knows what they're doing and is gonna you know treat the bands. Well, you know, I mean, this guy's making money off writing articles about me and screwing my life up. You know, how am I supposed to make another record? Yeah, right. And Part of you goes, man, I didn't come here to just deal with this. You know, I'll just go away. You, you, not, I'm talking about not just go away from Chicago. I mean, I just, you know, why go to all the work of trying to make a record and put everything into it if you're going to get bagged on, you know? Yeah, it seems like a lot of these critics, any band that... Um you know, I've seen it happen before, but not to this magnitude, where you guys are, are doing a really good thing right now, and people have recognized it, and that's why you are as popular as you are, but it seems like you have critics like this guy that just can't deal with people that are successful. Yeah, um, one of the hardest things for us to deal with is jealousy, and there's a lot of it about, and it's, it's, it's really hard because, you know, it's, it's like I'll walk into a store in, in Hollywood, and ask to see something very nicely and the guy behind the counter will start going I work 8 to 5 I don't need this crap and I can refuse service to anyone and, blah, 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 blah. and it's like whoa what did I do dude I'm, I wasn't mad about anything I don't care if you're mad or not you can get out of my store <laughs> it's like you know what? Yeah. I was probably sleeping behind the garbage can behind his store at one point yeah. and the, the <laughs> he's mad at me because I got successful it's, it's a real hard thing for us to deal with because when, when other people get successful it's like you know, if if we find something good in what they're doing, their music or something, we're happy for them, you know? Well, that's a healthy way to look at things. Other people try to, I guess, maybe because their own insecurities, they knock the successful people down because they couldn't be successful themselves or whatever. But that's a shame that, that that's the case, and I hope that, uh, you know, this would be an isolated thing here in town because, uh, you know, Chicago's a really cool town. If, if I work here, I just don't want anyone getting the wrong impression from me if I'm not hanging and I'm not if I'm not partying and hanging and talking to everybody and signing everything and doing all the photos and this and that. Because, I mean, we've only had about six months really to try and get our lives together and, and deal with things, you know. It's like, yeah, there's a lot of people who go, I wish I had your problems, you know, but at the same time, you know, trying to make sure, you know, you invest your money right and it doesn't get stolen, you don't lose every cent you made. That's a weird thing. We've never had that before. Yeah, and probably a lot of people, a lot of, uh, I, I would imagine there'd be a lot of parasite-type people that would crawl out of the woodwork to, to get close to you guys at this point. Oh, yeah. Yeah? Oh, yeah, it's a new lawsuit every week. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, with uh, the, the short time that a record company will give a band to come up with their second album, too, I would imagine that the pressures have to be there. 
Yeah, I mean that that pressure's there. We pretty much have a say so of of when we you know going to do what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. But I mean, there's like 30, 40 songs to be worked on. And the thing that got me right before I came up here to start rehearsals was that wow, and there ain't one simple one there. <laughs> You know, so that means every song is going to take a lot of work for arrangement. You have to remember that a lot of the material is not road tested. You know, it hasn't been out in the clubs. So we have to try to do the work on our own and, you know, and chop everything apart. For the first album, we were in the clubs, we tested everything out, made changes as we went over the course of a year, you know, and then had six months to make the record. This is like, we're going in and we got to get it right, right off the get-go. You know, there's no testing. Yeah, there's no testing. We a couple shows here and there, but there's no real testing to find out what really works and what doesn't. We have to just use our brains and figure out what works. You know, and people think, oh, yeah, they just wrote these songs. No, me and Izzy have been working at this band for over 10 years. So. Yeah, the, the work that people don't see that goes into it, I'm sure, is just monumental. More calls for Axl Rose? Let's take a few more on VBX. Oh, hi. Hello. Oh, Axl. What's happening? Go ahead. Oh, uh, I think that guy from Tribute should leave you alone. Because you're here in Chicago trying to make a new record, and, you know, you get, you're too busy for everything. That's that's nice. Yeah, did you read the article? No. Uh, well, don't bother. It's probably uh, not even worth... Maybe we should just not buy any more Tribunes. Yeah, I just don't I like, like the impression time. it gives of our manager. It makes our manager sound like he thinks we're just... We're just the best. We don't need anybody in the world. And blah, blah, blah. Because there's comments that I'm sure he made. But he made those in the middle of an argument when this guy was, like, really pressuring to get a, an interview on me or he's going to screw us up. And, you know, and our manager yelled back at him, you know. Things get said things get said in different in, in arguments. And Doug's one of the nicest guys in the business and has one of the, you know, he's one of the most respected men in the business. I mean, it's like every band we've ever worked with or known about has tried to hire him out from underneath us for double or triple the money and he said no because he believes in what we do and you know he's just a real upfront straightforward guy yeah there's got to be a certain amount of responsibility uh requirement to be a, a newspaper writer that i don't see there uh, i mean if i say something on the radio i'm held accountable for it but they can put these uh articles out and it's a tangible thing i mean if i say something on the air it's air and it's gone but unless somebody tapes it but if something's in print I mean, that seems to go a little further sometimes. And it's, and it's, it's like, that's one of the things I get mad at the most is I, I was like, we take what we do really seriously. You know, if we're trying to put, if we want to put out a song that sounds sloppy and stuff or whatever because it was fun, like the marquee thing. You know, that was fun. We just wanted it on tape because it was a piece of history that meant a lot to our lives, you know. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted it, you know. And however it came out, and that's how it came out. But if we're trying to do something really serious and put all the work into it, you know, and have everything perfect, we do that too. And I think a lot of journalists, you know, everybody has to pay the rent, so they're under the under the gun, under the pressure to do it real quick, and they don't take the time to really get involved, you know. And that's part of the problem of the world is everybody's so worried about making their, you know, trying to get rent money that they go at things just as quick as they can without putting a, a lot of deep thought into it and make sure they get it right and try to respect everybody's feelings involved. Yeah, and I hate when I see people that are willing to feed off of the success of others, like in the case of a lot of these uh, uh, journalists, I guess, would be uh, prime examples of that. I don't hate journalists. I think journalism is a great thing, you know. I mean, at one time in, like, high school, it was something I was contemplating, but... Then I decided, wait, I'm going to go for it, you know, rather than write about it. There's a guy that wrote an article about Metallica in the Sun-Times over the weekend that put a picture in and had the caption under the picture. It was the old, it was with Cliff. Mm -hmm. And he even went as far as saying Metallica and with um, Cliff, Cliff. Burton, yeah, with Cliff Burton will be at Alpine Valley over the weekend. I mean, check your sources, dude. I have to remember things. It's like about... I'm not bagging on the Chicago Sun or whatever, but I think it was a writer from there who basically is the is responsible for breaking up and the Alice, you know, helping make sure the Alice Cooper band, you know, crumbled years ago. You know, he wrote a book. He went out on tour. They took him in. They made him a part of things. They had him sing backups on the record. They took him out on tour with them. And then he went and exposed every little thing and every little difference that each band member had. Yeah, that was Bob Green, who's now with the Tribune, too. So. Yeah, in a, in a book called Billion Dollar Babies, and it helped destroy the band. Because then there was a book, Me, Alice, I don't know how well it sold, and it's hard to find, where he basically says that that, that book made the band not able to talk to each other. 
And I don't understand, what I don't understand is that a journalist, a lot of times, if they're writing about um, an act, a performing act, or if they're not writing about the music and, and critiquing that, if they're just writing about the people in their lives, they're making money off the band, you know? They're making their living off writing about someone else. Why don't they work together? You know, if they're going to print a photo, why don't they print a good photo? It helps sell more papers or magazines or whatever. Yeah. You know, rather than say, okay, we got this really rotten shot. Let's run this one, you know. Well, it's like you were saying, they don't take the time to make sure it's right. Yeah, there's a, you know, a hip parader and, and circus are real good at, like, printing fake interviews. And um, That's probably where I get all the, the misquotes that I <laughs> ask people when I'm interviewing them. And putting quotes out of context or with different people that said them and changing things around or taking three quotes and cramming them into one sentence so they make a really wild sentence for their magazine. And the thing is, is it doesn't really hurt us um, publicly that much, but it hurts us inside because we know that's not what we said or what we were trying to show people. And it's not... And the biggest thing is it's not fair to the people that buy that magazine. If all they got is money for a pack of cigarettes and a candy bar and a magazine, and then they get home and read something that's all crap, it's not fair to them. Because they see your picture there, and they probably figure that, you know, it was endorsed by you, and then it, it's the wrong thing. How about a couple more calls here? Sure. All right. VBX, you're on with Axel Rose. Hi, Axel. This is a big thrill for me. I think you guys are the greatest. And I read that article in the Tribune today, and I thought the guy sucks. I don't know what he's thinking about. I also read that article that he was talking about with uh, Winger. Yeah. And uh, dude, don't don't think that all Chicago is like this. We're not. Oh, I this don't think all Chicago is like that. It's just surprising to get it from such a big I just, thing right away. Uh, it just makes you nervous, making you think that, that you think that this is how everybody is here because we're not. No, it's just, you know, I just want to try to get some work done. I know? hope you do because I... I and I don't want people to be offended. Really Guns and Roses get some work done here in town, which is what they're here for. Hey, I read everything that the guy said in the Tribune today, and I hope nobody is bugging you guys at all because it's a bunch of bullshit, and I'm sorry. But uh, I hope you guys can get anything you can do done so you guys can get on a tour and your next album out is made. It's well, I mean, there's a lot of possibilities. Done. I mean, if, if we can keep things together and try to get some things done and eliminate as many outside pressures as we can for now, because there's a lot of work. There's, it's like we have a big job. We have a big job to do, and you know, to try and bury appetite. <laughs> you know, that's and there's like there's a lot of songs. I mean, we hope to re to release a double album, you know, and something that's like basically you're getting two appetites instead of just one album, you know, and and record plenty of songs for the B sides and stuff that are that are just as good as anything on the album. You know, it's like we want to give as much as we can this time because it'll be a long time before we're in the studio again. There'll be live records and stuff like that, and. It'll be a long time, so we want to go in and do as much stuff as we can now. With the exception of the guy's article in the in the paper today, how have you found Chicago to be as far as a town that can uh, you can be creative in? You know, every, everything's been pretty cool, but I've only been here a couple of days, you know, and this thing just happens right away. Yeah. It's kind of like a shock. I mean, I've already trashed my place. You know, they're going to love me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to do that. <laughs> right? That's a requirement. <laughs> I, er, earlier tonight, I played uh, One in a Million. I think I'm probably the only radio guy in town that will play that song because they're all a bunch of... Talk about that? Yeah. Uh, about the racial comments and things? Yeah, you want to you want to tell about what the real intention is? I'll try is? and enlighten people because this is something very important to us. All right. Um, we use the word niggers on there. That doesn't apply to anybody that's trying to get their life together and, and take care of themselves and move forward. What that was meant was about at a bus station in L.A. where you have predominantly a large group of black people that are selling stolen jewelry, heroin, crack, and trying to rip you off, ripping kids off, pulling, pulling uh, bowie knives on people and stealing you know, whatever belongings that these people have when they get off the bus or trying to get on the bus to get out of there. And that word was used. It's like, and black people use that word amongst each other. Like, you know, it's just normal language. One of my favorite bands right now, I don't know what I think of them, you know, morally or whatever, but I like the band N.W.A., which is niggers with attitudes, <laughs> you know. Um, 
Well, you know, it doesn't have to, I mean, the word itself... It freaked word. a lot of people out. We had the Ku Klux Klan saying that, that we were promoting the Ku Klux Klan and we'll be doing shows to raise money for them. <laughs> nice. We had a letter sent from our lawyer saying, no, that's, you know, not the case, don't use our name again. Well, wasn't there some sort of a, a thing for AIDS in New York that they asked you to play and then they found out the tune was uh, your tune and then they asked you not to play? Yeah, which um, David Geffen had helped set up us playing that, you know, and he was kind of hurt by it. But then again, you know, I've been attacked by homosexuals, and out in L.A., especially West Hollywood, which is now kind of boys' town capital of the world, you know, you have a lot of militant gay people, you know, trying to just shove it in your face all the time, you know, and it's just, get out of my way. It's like, what I don't understand is why people have to keep screwing with each other all the time. I can see if you're drunk or something, you know, and get things get out of hand, but, you know, when you're trying to take care of business, you know, why do you have to, like, go out of your way to attack someone else who just doesn't think the way you do? You know, it's like, don't you have something better to do to get your life going and make your income? Yeah, it's almost like a, a way to avoid getting their own life together. Yeah. It's like blaming, well, you know, because I, I, you know, we meet a lot of people who they'll start out being really cool, and then all of a sudden they'll just see, you know, they see money and things around, and all of a sudden they're, they're resentful because their life isn't where yours is at now and and they're mad it's like it's really weird it's like when we were starving on the streets there was like two groups there was us who were starving and there were them who had the mercedes and everything right yeah so now i'm one of them i'm the bad guy and i never really planned on that or looked at it you know i thought people would be like wow i got there cool you know congratulations some people are like that but there's a there's a large number of people that don't necessarily feel that way. They're, you know, they're jealous and mad about that you got, you got some cash and didn't. But it's not like, you know, we had it handed to us. I mean, nobody wanted to play the record, <laughs> you know, to start out with. You yeah, know, we I... just kept fighting and basically somewhat teaching our record company how to market our record, which that means coming off the streets, we had to be all of a sudden very professional businessmen when dealing with certain people, you know, and that's a whole new pressure and strain, you know? I mean, that's why people jump out of buildings on Wall Street. <laughs> <laughs> how, how do you guys manage to keep uh, uh, all the tension and stress that must just be mounting at times from affecting you? Well, that's why we split L.A. <laughs> yeah, I guess. You know, and yeah. to come here and just get try, try to get away from everything and work. I mean, it's hard because he says something about the Beatles being able to hide and whatever, but, you know, we're not into, you know, putting on costumes and going out in disguise. And, and it's like I said, we were experts at hanging out. And now you can't really hang out. You know, because we're used to being, you know, the way the way it was before Guns N' Roses took off is you go to a club and no one, if they knew you or not, you know, you weren't special. No one really liked you that much, you know, and you could do what you wanted to do and find ways to do it. Now you walk into a place, and if there's 400 people there, you got to talk to 350 of them that you don't know. And it's, I'm glad they're into the record, but it's it's kind of draining just just talk, just you know, shooting the crap with all these people you don't know. It's it's kind of a weird thing. Well, you get no no chance to enjoy your own thing. Yeah, it takes you like two hours just to get to the bar. <laughs> yeah, what, do you uh, when you get to hang out at those times when you do have a chance to have some privacy? Is that where you can come up with some of the things you write about? Um, sometimes, yeah. 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 We have a, we have a new song we call our punk song that's got a line in it. Why do you look at me when you hate me? <laughs> Why should I look at you when you make me hate you too? I sense a smell of retribution in the air, and I don't know why you expli expletive care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, that could summarize uh, some situations I've been in, definitely. <laughs> definitely. It's like, we're just doing what we do, man. Just do what you do. We're not bagging on you. Right. Well, people, you know, they have that world owes me a living kind of thing sometimes. People that, uh, like you're saying, now you're... Which, that can be a positive thing, because that can motivate you. That can make you work. It can make you try really hard at what you do. I mean, we were welcome to the jungle, because we had a gig at the Troubadour with some band, the Joneses and and Jet Boy. We were opening. And uh, I went down and heard the Joneses and uh, this band, Dogs of War, that used to be out there, and heard them and realized... We gotta work a lot harder if we wanna, you know, if we wanna pull this off, you know. And so it was an incentive. It made me work harder. But you know, you gotta aim, try to aim. It's like hating things aren't necessarily negative if you find a positive way to generate that as a motivation. You know, it's a motivating 
force. You know, but if you use it just to bag on people and complain all the time, you're just dragging yourself farther down. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Those those are those people are around all over the place. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, Axel, a couple more calls, and then maybe uh, I'll let you get some privacy here. All right. All right. VVX, you're on with Axel Rose. Hey, Axel, what's going on? I'm trying. All right. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, that I'm from Round Lake. I got a band, and I know what you're talking about. It is pretty hard to get things going. You know, as far as as far as things going. Um, I mean. When we're easily distracted. Huh? <laughs> I said we're easily distracted. Well, we're from Round Lake, and we used to play in, like, we did uh, Los Angeles. We went to Los Angeles for a while. Mm -hmm. and we tried to make it there, and we couldn't believe how many bands were there. It was incredible. Oh, yeah, there's, like, what, like eight years ago, there was over 50,000 bands. What kind of advice could you, uh, at, at this point, I don't know if you've gotten a chance to see any Chicago Rockers. I haven't yet, no. Yeah, it must be kind of tough to get out there. No, you just follow, you know, you got to follow your heart with your music and make sure you're digging out every single thing you can. It's like, if you've got a lyric, if you've got a verse that just, you go, well, it'll work, but it doesn't feel right. Work on it till you find the one that feels right and you know that that's what you wanted to say in your heart. Because that's, and then fight for it, you know? Fight for that song. And that's, it'll get you a lot farther. I mean, there's some bands and there's some people you know, it, it kind of freaks me out, and I get jealous because there's some bands that just write whatever they think people want to hear. doesn't have anything to do with the way they feel, and they stick it out in a song, and all of a sudden they're majorly successful. It doesn't work for this band, and and that's worked out good because we're, you know, it's like I know in 10 years I'm still going to be proud of my record. I'm not going to put it on and go, ah, that was just some garbage I did to make money. And I just got to dig in your heart, and that, and that it makes things hard to live with. Like, I always wonder how the Stones did not commit suicide with writing as deeply about all the subjects that they write about. You know, but that's... Yeah, they're totally exposed. Or, you know, they expose themselves in their music, and it takes a lot of work to under, try to understand things. And is that is that your uh, ultimate uh, writing goal, is to give the most honesty? Yeah, just give the most... Uh, because it's like them, cause I'm the one who has to live with it in the long run, you know. It's like in 10 years, people might not care about Guns N' Roses, but it was part of my life, you know, and I want to be proud of what I did. Well, I have a feeling in 10 years, people are going to care a lot more about Guns N' Roses than you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> the 10-year reunion tour, huh? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Well, you'll have to find a very remote part of uh, the world to hang out at that point if it's, if it's this crazy now. Yeah, who knows? I mean, it's like, you know, we could break up tomorrow, but at the same time, it's like you put the five of us in a room, we'll be Guns N' Roses, so it really doesn't matter if we ever break up or not, because as long as we decide to get together and play and record, we'll be Guns N' Roses. Can't help it when we get in the same room. Well, that's good to hear. I mean, you know, because I, I know that I certainly probably speak for a lot of uh, VVX listeners and a lot of rockers everywhere would, would hope that, you know, things would continue a long time. We start learning how to deal with pressure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, maybe we can keep things cool for you in Chicago for the time being. Everybody that's listening, don't bother them. You've been great, man. You've been great. Another call, and then I'll let you go? All right. All right. PVX, you're on with Axel. Hi. Hello, Corey. what's happening? Um, I just wanted to tell Axel that I hope he doesn't leave Chicago. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> because we're really not that bad. Uh, I'll be in and out of Chicago, I'm sure, for the rest of my life. So. Well, you're, you're from Lafayette. Or... Yeah, I'm not from far from here anyway. Yeah, I mean, uh, is there still relatives in that area? Oh, yeah. It's like, uh, you know, I grew up listening to one of your rivals, you know. Yeah. I had a, just well, my... I lived with my grandma, and she had a cheap little plastic radio, so I could only get LS in. Well, they don't even exist really anymore, but... But it used to be kind of fun back then. Sure. It was probably about the same time I was doing that, too, listening to it. I mean, to think that Kiss had, you know, you're not the only one I ever had on AM radio is kind of amazing. Yeah, I'm hoping that the, the radio thing transitions around again where... Uh, and it seems maybe it is it is kind of going that nice way. Nice to see that happen. You know, we got to move past the stage of classic radio. This classic radio is just figuring out ways to play everything that they've played for the last 10 years and keep playing it. You know, and it's like, and I like that and I appreciate it, but they don't so much, and, they, and those stations are kind of taking over a bit, and they don't so much want to, you know, recognize that there are some new bands that are following everything that we were taught by the bands in the 70s. You know, Guns N' Roses would not be near as successful if you had all the bands that were following their hearts so much in the 70s. 
you know, you wouldn't have, you know, because there was there was Nazareth, PTO, Foghat, Uriah Heap, you know, it's, the list just goes on, you know, mm-hmm. you know, Aerosmith, ACDC, Led Zeppelin, Queen, blah, 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 blah. You don't have so many bands of that caliber, you know, just trying to say what they wanted to say as best as they can. Well, classic radio wouldn't exist if uh, if those bands didn't exist too, and that's that's the thing is they're really killing off a whole format by not allowing the new bands to be heard. And yeah, you know, it's it, it's kind of strange. You know, what what is cool is there's a lot of new stations that you know are pushing a lot of the new bands, and it's you know one of the biggest things that helped us out. You know, but there's still stations in LA, some major stations that you know don't want to acknowledge the fact that. You know, Guns N' Roses is, is a real band trying to write real music off all the laws of music we were taught in the 70s. And, you know, they don't they don't want to welcome new people to that. Well. Because they don't want to lose their heroes. You know, it's like they don't want new heroes. They don't want to lose their old heroes. You're not going to lose your old heroes. You're not going to lose the fact that the Stones and Zeppelin and the Beatles and things are great. But there may be some bands with, you know, one or two songs that might kind of get up in that. I don't know, you know, get up to that category, you know, yeah. I have a song that's that good, you know. Well, and I, I think, too, that, you know, they think they're going after an older audience with that classic rock stuff, but I think it's an insult to an older, whatever they consider older, like a person in their late 20s, an insult to them to assume that they don't want to hear anything new. Mm-hmm. So. I mean, like, I don't have anything against Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, but, you know, I mean, how long every day are you going to hear the stuff that came out way back then? You know, it's like... That's great. I, it's like I listen to everything from Frank Sinatra, you know, to M.O.D. Yeah. Okay. You know, because I try to find something good in everything, and 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 try to open my mind up. If I if someone goes, oh, that that music's for fags, or that's old, that's for old people, I'll listen to it and go, but I might learn something out of this, you know, and find a good melody or something, you know, and and you do, you know, and it's that's good to hear. I mean, I, I'm glad you're saying that because I find a lot of times it's really tough to open people's minds up if they're very locked into a, a certain um, thing, and, and it's it's really tough to open them up sometimes. I mean, like Frank Sinatra's got a, a, a Michelob commercial, I believe, and, you know, and, and they'll bag on it on heavy metal stations that, you know, that the advertisers have booked that commercial on, right? And then, and then some of the DJs will bag on that song, but, you know, I heard that, and I started laughing, and then I listened to the song, and then I tried singing it my way, you know, and... It worked. The melody was there. You know, I just used my voice and stuff. And the thing is, is I could have done that commercial or put it on a put it on a record, and people would have gone, "That's really cool." It's like, yeah, you know, it's just a different person singing it, but it's the same melody, it's the same words, same feeling. It's just relating to a different age group because the guy's a different age. You know, yeah. Just I try not to bag on things. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you're, you know, very open-minded. I've I've dealt with people in, in other bands that come in here and. Or talk to me on the phone that just are full of, just uh, it seems like hatred a lot of times. Well, that's 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 another thing about hate. I mean, hate is a is a motivating force. It's like, it's kind of like we can't hate any bands now because so many bands like us. And you know, and you hate some band and then you meet them and they're the nicest people in the world and they love your album. They know every chord change. They know the harmonies and they know all this stuff, and you can't hate the band anymore because you've met nice guys. You might the music, you know, you start to find some things that you like in their music. You know, it's a weird thing, but if if we hadn't like hated all these bands when we first started, you know, and wanted to change things, it wouldn't have motivated us to where we're at. I talk with Nikki Six sometimes for Motley Crue, and and I you know I've told him flat out, man, I used to hate you guys. I just hated you, you know. But that hatred of Motley Crue helped. And they were so big in L.A., it helped motivate me to get on top, you know, and work at it. And and then I've gone back before we went and did the tour with them and listened to a lot of things and found a lot of things I did really like and realized I was just stupid and closed-minded and jealous and this and that. And I went back over those things, you know. And now I haven't heard their record, but Slash seems to think it's really good, one of the best things they've done, their new one. And, you know, and they've taken some lessons. We've taken a lot of lessons from them. They taught us a lot on the road and a lot of things. And they've taken some pointers from us about following their hearts. You know, they're like, you know, thanks to you guys, we can, like, dig deeper and, and be more experimental in our music and try things, and we can wear more what we want rather than just try to put on a, a theater show with our act and stuff. It's kind of, a, it's, it's, it's turned into a positive thing. Some yeah. bands it doesn't, other bands it has. That kind of cooperation would be really cool. That I, I'm glad to hear about it because a lot of times we don't hear that that exists, but uh, I think that's great. 
I mean, we have rivalries with all kinds of bands, but usually it's on a personal level, something that happened outside of the music, you know? I mean, the whole Poison thing didn't have anything to do with what we thought of their music. It didn't matter if we liked it or we didn't. It was, you know, things that happened on personal levels, you know? And we've kind of pretty much got past that for the moment, but I'm sure, you know, it'll find a new way to raise its ugly head and continue. What? Hey, I know what I was going to ask you before I let you go. What was with that... Was there a comic book or something that got put out that somebody... Uh, it's a piece of crap, ain't it? <laughs> yeah, I, I did see it, and I guess, what, there was, um, like, it was unauthorized. Yeah, you know, and there's a lot of things that can be legally done, you know, and that you can't do anything about. Um, that comic book, it's like, we weren't against the idea of a comic book, but, you know, we would have liked the artwork to be better and more representative of the people in the band, or or at least, if you know, if it was going to be character characterizations you know, show something that related to the actual identity of the members of the band. And, and the story was somewhat accurate, but in certain ways it wasn't, you know. And then they made a big deal of us and Poison, you know, and stuff like that. And, at the, and the time when the thing came out was just about the time that, you know, Bobby Dahl and I were starting to finally get along, talking on the phone and stuff, you know, and work some things out. He liked some things about our videos. I liked some things about his, you know. Yeah. And it, it seems like, once again, you got a case of another uh, outside force trying to make money off of your success. Yeah. There was another thing. Um, MTV um, had a commercial out a while ago, dollar one nine hundred number or something, talk to Guns N' Roses. And I'm, I believe they've subsequently um, discontinued the commercial, but the guy's supposedly still in business. That has nothing for your listeners that has nothing to do with Guns N' Roses we have no, I don't know what set on I never called it but the guy's making like 30 grand a day unbelievable yeah because they're getting like 5,000 calls a day and and yet sex not calls. sanctioned authorized or have anything to do with us and you know we don't know what they're saying on it or whatever it's just someone taking advantage of us and and fans you know, this guy's making money off fans that are into Guns N' Roses and want to find out about Guns N' Roses, and this guy's making a killing at it, and he doesn't really care about either person. Is there anything you can do to, to stop it? Legally, him? no. Yep. Legally, it's like you could go to court. And most One of the biggest problems is, is that you can go to court, yeah, you can sue people, but you're going to be in there for years, and there's not a guarantee you're going to win, especially when you look like we do and, and whatever. If we go into a court of law, you know, Nine times out of ten, if the judge is like 70 years old and they look at this nice person in their nice suit and their hair done and what the judge considers respectable, it's like there's a good chance they're going to win, not us. So then you end up doing out-of-court settlements and people, you know, because we've, we've been sued a lot and had to pay people money because it would cost us more to fight them in court even if we were completely right and knew it. We didn't have the time because we're on tour and we don't have the time to shut things down and, and go to court. Yeah, before we went on the air, you were telling me something about uh, some of the bootlegs that have been out there circulated. Somebody stole a track out of your out of your place. Um, and yeah, there's a song, November Rain, that someone stole from me about well, a year and a half ago now, Christmas, and then put it out as an album. And it's it just it kind of hurts, and it's you know because the song means a lot to me, and it's not fair to the fans to get. It. You know, I, I understand why people want bootlegs and practice tapes and this and that. You know, I can understand all that, but not when it's, you know, kind of undermining, you know, what the band is trying to do. Because basically, I look at it like this. When I go buy a record by Queen, you know, and I know how much money they spent in the studio, half a million dollars or three quarters of a million to record an album. It's like, you as the listener get to own that for eight bucks, twelve bucks, something that cost a half a million dollars to make and took everything out of these people and drain them so where they weren't able to even move and they had to go like sit on a beach and not even enjoy it just to get their energy back you know they sit there going because they've drained themselves by putting their life and their soul into a piece of work you know i really appreciate that but then you've got people who just you know they want well, okay yeah well what about your record dude you know you owe me and it's like <laughs> i don't you know they don't understand the work that's involved i know Hughie that i played he plays guitar and i've worked with him since junior high school and he lives out in LA and he was the original guitar player with me and is he he um, is now getting his masters in phys physics teaches flying lessons builds jets at McDonnell Douglas and takes piano lessons and plays guitar and we still write together renaissance man yeah he's insane he's insane and he, he's one of the most creative people I know and it's like he didn't even understand 
how much work was involved. I brought him in to sing, to help sing out, sing on the beginning of Paradise City, and it didn't work out. You know, Paul's got a good voice, but it didn't quite fit right, and it didn't work out. But it, and he finally understood. Wow, I didn't realize how much work it actually takes to go in and and do it in a studio. You know, it's like we're not the type of people that wake up in the morning and we look perfect and we and we can just pick up the guitar and we play perfect and we can write perfect. It just don't work that way. You know, we're just you know kids that hung out on the street and then if we really really focus as hard as we possibly can, we can come up with something. You know, it just yeah. doesn't happen overnight. And that's why being in Chicago uh, was originally an idea to, to give you a chance to focus like that. And uh, I hope that... Out in L.A., all you got calls from lawyers and realtors and merchandisers. And uh, i got four phones beside my bed, and all I do is I'm on the phone. <laughs> it's like i got to go make a record. I want to make a record right now. I want to write. The time is right to write. It's coming out really... St we, we had one rehearsal, and we went through six new songs in rehearsal and just ripped the crap out of them. We're there. It's there. It's like I was scared up until this point going, what's the world going to think of what we do on this next record? I know it'll be us, but what will they think? We have so much to live up to now. I don't, get, I don't care now because <laughs> I'm happy with the stuff, and it's, it's powerful. It's there. But it took this long, you know, to realize where we're at and what we have to do, you know, and what type of songs we have to write to try and write a record as strong as Appetite. But well, why don't we, uh, for now. yeah, why don't we, like, just, you know, say once again, hey, everybody in Chicago, uh, we, we want to leave uh, Guns N' Roses with a real good impression of the city, and we don't want that. Put on these facades and act like whatever it took to, like, be with you and this and that, and it's like, you know, what, since September, I've probably thrown 80 girls out. <laughs> Get out, you know, when you're just trying to meet someone that you think's cool, and then you've got to throw them out because, you know, within 20 minutes, they're trying to screw you over for something. It's like, yeah, backstage bimbos. I'll pay for everything. Just <laughs> chill out. <laughs> yeah, a lot of backstage bimbos. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but then, you know, then it, it just gets out of hand because, you know, looking for that security. You know, yeah. can't blame them, but it's like, chill out, you know, when you rather have like some, a friend that you could like depend on rather than someone that you're going to screw over and if they catch you, they're going to get you back or never talk to you again. Sometimes uh, it must be tough to to handle all, all of those kinds of pressures all at once, I would assume, you know, coming out. But why don't we uh, be cool, Chicago? Let's leave Guns, <laughs> let Guns N' Roses uh, hang out here and that's what they do best. That's what Axel's saying, let them hang out and and uh, any VVX rockers that are out there tonight, let's let's uh, just, just keep hanging and don't. And, and uh, well, you know, if if it works, we'll try and do something special for Chicago because I always wanted to do something nice for this place because it's like I grew up listening to this place, you know. Yeah, well, maybe we can uh, when you guys finish up here in town. If everybody is cool, if everybody stays, uh, you know, their their distance lets you get your work done. We'll we'll do something. There's maybe. one thing we guarantee is I'm not even talking about the show. I'm talking about the way we do our tour next year. It's like we're planning out our own tour by our own rules. So it's it's definitely going to be you know it's not going to be just like okay they're going to play here then there and da da da. It's going to be organized a bit differently, you know because. You only get here once, so you might as well make the biggest event you can out of it. Oh yeah, man, that's that's a good idea. As long as how long you'll be here, so we got to make a big event out of it, and hopefully everybody will get more than their money's worth. All right, and uh, I, I've got the perfect tune. I was like searching this uh, Appetite album and and the live one, and a couple of these little uh, Japanese imports that I have for the perfect tune to get out of this interview on. <laughs> you know, all right. I think I've got it. I think you're going to know what it is, too. It's uh, track four on the CD on Appetite. You know what? How'd you give me? Yeah. <laughs> Perfect or what? Perfect. All right, we're going to do it. Axel Rose, can you hang on a second when we uh, get off the air here? Yeah. All right, cool. Thanks for checking in tonight. Hey, thanks, everybody. And uh, what can we do with the Tribune? I think we can wipe our butts with it, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I think everybody should write, every, every, every person. You know, get your parents to write. They like it if the older people write, too. You know, get everybody to write to, to not, the Tribune and just say, what, what is this guy, you know? Not too... Like, not, we came here, you know, and, you know, 
for for hard rock and roll came here to work in Chicago that you know make Chicago look cool too you know I guess yeah they're trying to keep Sears in town and this guy's trying to screw it up for everybody yeah they're trying to keep businesses in town I mean they really hated it when the Sox were going to leave and they tried to keep Sears from moving out of town I mean you're bringing attention here bringing business here and focusing uh, positive stuff here for the music industry and this little jag at the Tribune is is like ruining it so maybe don't write to him write to the uh, editor of the Tribune yeah. Because then he can't... Don't write to him. He'll just throw the letter in the trash. No right. one ever saw it. So make that uh, something to do this week for those that are uh, able to, to use the pen. Yeah. Otherwise, phone calls. Those are always good. Yeah. You, you, it's like you want, you want, you want a writer that's going to, like, you know, care about the city, you know, and care about bands and things like that, you know, and someone who wants to give you some information. Like, I mean, this guy could have wrote some other kind of hey, could have wrote a different type of piece you know yeah well you came to Chicago because you care about Chicago and you wanted to to do the work here that you yeah, needed yeah we thought it'd be cool you know? yeah. so maybe it still will be well let's hope alright Axel out to get me but uh, let's uh, get, let him get some work done while he's in town here <laughs> on VBX Rock 103 Rock on alright um, police at the Nassau Coliseum in New York arrested 27 people on drug charges last week at a Jerry Garcia band concert. Drugs at a Jerry Garcia concert? No. Police seized over an ounce and a half of ecstasy along with various other drugs, and police also charged some of those arrested with selling balloons filled with laughing gas. <laughs> a new venue. <laughs> A new, a new what? Uh, or not a new venue, a new idea, a new marketing idea. Nitrous oxide in balloons. Want to buy it? <laughs> Make you laugh through the show. MTV has banned comedian Andrew Dice Clay from the network. Next time a balloon gets <laughs> bounced my way at a concert, I might just hold on to it. Pop it open. <laughs> hitting it up. Well, MTV has banned Andrew Dice Clay from their network after his appearance on the Music Awards show last Wednesday. Clay had supposedly agreed to do only clean material during his act. By whose standards? Well, according to agreement between Clay and all the uh, official people at MTV. But then when he did go on the air, his act, as they put it, got raunchy. And so MTV's vice president apologized for Clay's breach of agreement and apologized to its viewers for what happened. I guess he was really going off... Yeah. On fat women and share and everything. It was uh, loaded with yeah, and loaded with <laughs> material that. And they had to delete a lot of it, and in other MTV. So he's banned from MTV for life. Yeah, no more. They said forget about it. In other MTV backstage news, Vince Neil of Motley Crue threw a few punches at Guns N' Roses' Izzy Stradlin for a previously unsettled problem which involved Vince's wife. Why was she on the plane when, when <laughs> Izzy took the whiz? I mean, she might have been, but apparently Vince uh, saw Izzy there and kind of beat the crap out of him, but then everything was okay. After he beat him up, it was like, okay, it's settled, and they walked away friends. So, I don't know. It's yeah, something... To sure they oh, did. <laughs> that's the report I got. So. Yeah, the report right out of the record company. <laughs> so, I think there was probably a bigger show backstage at the MTV Music Awards than anything that was shown on TV. But that's it for tonight's Hard Rock Headlines. I'm Kim Kelly. Well, we'll have, uh, we'll have none of that. We know the truth. We, we like to speak the truth here. And we, we will one day put those who use irrationality as their... Uh, their method of manipulating us. Their whole way of existing. Yeah, we will one day put all of those irrational people, we will one day put their balls right to the wall. When the lights go down, you'll know it's time to rock. Cinderella's gonna heat up the night. July 26th at the Creek Music Theater. A night of serious rock and roll. Cinderella. Miller Genuine Draft Concerts at Poplar Creek Music Theater. Presents A Night with Cinderella. Plus two, two incredible special guests. Winger and Red Hot Bullet Boys. 
Tickets are on sale now at all Ticketmaster Ticket Centers or charged at 559-1212. Live at the Creek, Bullet Boys, Winger, and Cinderella. July 26th, brought to you by Miller Genuine Draft, as real as it gets. For the BBX Chicago Rockers Spotlight. So listen up. Okay, everybody ready to go. Let's stand by and cue the house lights. Two black in five, four, three, two, one. You can rack out with commandment on Sunday, July 2nd at the Thirsty Well. They're going to be kicking off a show at about 7 o'clock. And also at Cats. On Sunday, July 9th, 7 o'clock showtime for all ages. And Cats is located at 103rd and Harlem Avenue in Chicago Ridge. And while you're at Commandments Concerts, you can score a copy of their new record while you're out there. Just talk to the band about it. Also, Mueller Entertainment and the Chicago Metal Report present Wicked Rhyme. They're going to be live at the Thirsty Whale on Saturday, July 1st for a 7 o'clock all ages show. And don't miss the debut of Wicked Rhyme's new lineup. They're also performing at Chances Are Thursday, July 20th and Standing Room Only in Hammond in Indiana on Friday, July 21st. So get ready for a summer of rhyme and roll with Wicked Rhyme. If you want to put your band in the BBX Chicago Rockers Spotlight, call 831-5250 Monday and Wednesday evenings between 7 and 10. Just ask for Donna and tell her that you want to be in the spotlight here on VVX Rock 103. There is a Club Def VVX cruise happening this Sunday, July 2nd. You can uh, party on a boat out on Lake Michigan with some rockers that I think will definitely be rocking the boat. Snow White, Mortar, Sharon Tate's Baby, and all of your friends from VBX and Club Def, including Paul Kaiser, are going to be out there. Club Def happens every Sunday night out at the exit, but uh, this time it's going to be Club Def afloat. Even though a lot of people that go there float out, this time you'll be floating out in Lake Michigan. The Club Def party boat leaves from the south side of Navy Pier at 2 o'clock Sunday afternoon is going to return at 6. So catch some rays out there and catch some rock and catch a buzz because it's going to be a, a lot of brewski flow and all you can drink for the price of your ticket. And you can get your tickets at 1653 North Wells for the first annual VVX Club Def Cruise. So go on out and... The cool thing about taking a cruise as opposed to... Uh, airplane party when you get sick it doesn't have to stay on the on the plane with you <laughs> you can just do it over the deck yeah but Lake Michigan you don't want to <laughs> I mean isn't it kind of bad enough already yeah I think it's fish food though <laughs> it feeds the fish Yuck, and then we eat the fish yeah. that's sick <laughs> It's the ecosystem that the guy from Greenpeace was talking about tonight. Mm -hmm. Somebody was kind enough to put me on uh, Playboy's mailing list here. I think this is a, a promo copy. They probably sent it to me because they knew I'd talk about it. So, uh, and you'll receive the bill in the mail about a week or two down the road. I don't know. I, I wonder. But they had my best interests in mind. They had my best interests at heart. Because it makes my heart go pitter-patter mm -hmm. to look at this fold-out, Miss August. Uh, you want to know what she's about? Oh, sure. I'm dying to know. <laughs> Turn-offs, alarm clocks, and litter bugs. Turn-ons, jaguars, cowboy boots, <laughs> music, shopping, diamonds, and nature. Do you want to know her... Least favorite lines? Please. <laughs> These are lines she hates. You're so beautiful. I'll give you anything you want. Do you like my house? <laughs> when are you moving in? Yuck, she puts here. And this is a line that she likes, so I might write this one down <laughs> in case I run into her. Like every guy's not going to be using this line on her now if they see her. Like every guy's not going to go buy cowboy boots tomorrow, too. <laughs> yeah. Sure they won't. Here's the line she likes. I'll bet there's more to you than boot than. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'd, I'd do that. I'd meet her. I'd meet her, and I'd start checking out her, <laughs> yeah. her boobs or something. There's or going, more to you than boobs, aren't there? <laughs> just imagining her tight little tush here yeah, okay. underneath go her. Yeah, okay. Go on, go on. Then I'd screw the line up. <laughs> I'll bet there's more to you than beauty. 
Yeah, we know there is. <laughs> she just showed it. There's a whole lot more there than just beauty. There's uh Hmm. Where's she from? It's from Rhode Island. So she doesn't have that California. She didn't. Well, I guess she trimmed it down a little bit. But, oh uh, come on! <laughs> Cal, well, most of the California girls, you know, they're from California. They trim it right down into a nice little mohawk. <laughs> Here's uh, her ideal man. 25 to 35 years old, sexy, very successful, with integrity. He is sensitive, definitely not macho. And she plans to be a star, so he'll have to deal with that. And she's in love with the process of falling in love. Looks like she's falling in love with herself on this picture. <laughs> <laughs> she's a... Uh, and you just know that over on the nightstand somewhere, she's got a little uh, electric, yeah, yeah, yeah. electronic device. <laughs> 38, 24, 34. Is that possible? 38? <laughs> to stand up? <laughs> to keep For about another 10 years. <laughs> 10 years, they'll be hanging down. Uh, yeah, she'll be kicking them on her way down the street. Hmm. All right, well, thank you to whoever over at Playboy sent me the uh, August issue here. Should we get out of here on some Guns N' Roses? I think so. I like to tie everything in here. I like to tie everything up. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I tell any any of my dates mm -hmm. when, they, when they come over to my place. I like to tie everything up at the end. Yeah. <laughs> at the end of the night. And uh, so for Guns N' Roses, for Axel, and uh, for the... Uh, idiot at the Tribune that wrote the article that uh, almost chased them out of town here. We'll do a live tune from the uh, live like a suicide. Oh, wait, no, this is from GNR Lies. Right. Okay. That's different. Kind of. Yeah. Move to the city, but not to a city that has journalists that are, <laughs> that are total twerps. But uh, I would rather see that twerpy journalist eliminated then Guns N' Roses getting turned off to the whole city so thanks for listening to Ralph's Next I'll be back tomorrow night at 8 and we'll rock out here then again on VVX Rock 103